Hello, and welcome to this uh, new edition of our series of talks on decolonizing law. My name is uh, Alonso Gurmendi, and I will be um, in charge of convening this session uh, of, of the series. Uh, our, our talk today uh, has the pleasure to introduce to you uh, a a presentation by Professor Liliana Obregón from Universidad de los Andes in Colombia called Decolonizing the Construction of Knowledge, the Challenges of Editing a Handbook on International Law on the Americas. Um, Professor Obregón is a, is a professor of law and director of the LLM program in international law at the University of Los Andes in Bogota, Colombia. And she received her first law degree um, from the same university. She has a Master of Arts from the School of Advanced International Studies of John Hopkins University and a doctoral degree in SJD from Harvard University Law School. She, has a research, uh, she was a research scholar at the University of Helsinki from 2009 to 2012, working on a 19th century history project under the direction of professors Marty Koskeniemi and Bo Strath, and has also been a research fellow at Harvard University's Weatherhead Institute, Global History, David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies, Max Planck Institutes for Comparative and International Law in Heidelberg, and European Legal History in Frankfurt. She is also on the academic advisory board of several journals, including the Journal on the History of International and the Twale Review. Professor Obregón's research focuses on international legal history and historiography, ideologies and historical narratives, global and transnational intellectual history, with a particular interest in peripheral stories colonialism and forgotten actors and events of the 19th and 20th century Americas and Europe. Recent publications include Latin American anti-imperialism movements and anti-communist states during the Bandung era, empire, racial capitalism and international law, the case of manumitted Haiti and the, recognize, and the recognition of debt, and peripheral histories of international law. She is also co-editor of the future Oxford Handbook of International Law and the Americas. And it is my great pleasure to present you her, her presentation today. Please, Professor Obregón, welcome to the series, and uh, I am very glad to have you with us. Um, as everyone, I think, knows, uh, Professor Obregón will speak for 35 minutes, and then uh, the audience has a chance to send uh, their questions to us. In, in any case, a, a very warm welcome to you, Professor Obregón, and I look forward to your to your discussion. I really would like to, to first uh, thank you, Alonso, for, for chairing this session, and and of course, uh, to thank uh, Ralph uh, for organizing this series of, of uh, lectures and seminars, which I think are um, uh, fascinating and also very important to, to contemporary understanding of international law and especially to the practice of teaching and uh, writing and, and learning about international law. So, so I thank you all for, for this series. So, so um, well, first of all, I, I had to thank, uh, I wanted to say that it's much, it would be much nicer to be uh, precisely at, at UCL, University College London, and, you know, to dialogue indirectly. This is a picture, an old picture with, with Ralph um, on how much nicer it is to be in person to not only for the before and after, but the connections. And also because, because London, and, and UCL um, has this important connection to Jeremy Bentham, of course, and um, you know Bentham's um, uh, relation to the Americas in, in his decolonizing <laughs> text uh, that that he wrote um, not only to the Spanish colonies but also um, for the British colonies. But there's also a very particular connection of Bentham with Colombia and, and his project of, of uh, having a clean slate and, and uh, like an utopian um, a new states, um, which had a direct impact in, in Colombia's um, to Bentham or not to Bentham. You know, the teaching of, of Bentham in Colombia ended up, um, and the prohibiting of Bentham ended up being part of the, the way the liberal and conservative parties and, and, and also the vision of, of law to the future was discussed in, in, um, at that moment in the independence moment. But also London um, is uh, in relation to Bentham and to, and to the independence movement is, was the home for Francisco de Miranda. Uh, and I took these pictures uh, very close by to 
uh, UCL um, and his house, um, which um, was a, one of the most important libraries in London in, in the 19th century, where Andres Bello uh, lived and, and also studied in his library um, and ended up writing the first text of um, international law or the law of nations in the Americas as early as 1832. Um, and uh, he spent 20 years in the British Library now, this part of the British Museum, which, which for the UCL students, uh, I, I really uh, hope that you have visited uh, every time. Well, I've gone a few times and I'm always fascinated with uh, this first floor of the British Library because it's the opening of um, the Enlightenment and the way that they organized um, uh, knowledge at that time, that they were classifying and understanding knowledge and also understanding the connection to the, the newly discovered um, uh, lands or in the 19th, and also using humanism to, to um, um, begin to uh, make a, a different type of approach to knowledge, um, so so this is this connection with UCL and London is is really important. I think um, in the background of maybe my way of of thinking about this project of the Oxford Handbook on International Law and the Americas. So um, I wanted to to discuss this Oxford Handbook. Well, um, in in connection to um, my um, my, my experience or my academic and, and, and professional um, experience in uh, international law um, and the history of international law in, in the Americas and also the um, approaches, new approaches, the twail approaches, um, uh, as well as uh, critical legal studies and um, race theories and all these interdisciplinary tools that I have borrowed um, throughout, throughout the years. So uh, in 2019, I was uh, approached to give, um, or to, to see if I wanted to edit a handbook on international law in the Americas and um, on Latin America. And as Alonso may, uh, may know, there's, there's been a fad of international law uh, handbooks recently, right? It's sort of a comeback because they were, they were important in the early 20th century, perhaps, and, and, uh, um, and now they're coming back again as, as um, these, uh, I don't know, fortunately or unfortunately, but, but these type of encyclopedic knowledge may be canon setting or canon revisiting um, ideas. And also um, in all of the different uh, fragmentation of international law and all of the fields of international law that are that are today. So there are handbooks on everything from international environmental law to the theory and the history of international law. And then more recently, there's been um, there are a few handbooks that are in preparation um, in in area area studies of international laws. We could if we could call it that. So there's an Asian handbook. Um, 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 uh, Arabic uh, handbook possibly coming out and a twail handbook. Um, so in, in that, in the scope of those handbooks, I was approached to, to ask, and of course I, I was fascinated with the idea, but immediately I started stressing out because of the, the problematic um, nature of, uh, that could be the problematic nature of a handbook um, in terms of saying, you know, this is really the, the cutting edge or the scholarship or the canon on how uh, you, the reader, should see international law in this area or um, in this uh, um, region. And um, so my first question to, to the main editors at Oxford was like, um, do I have any restrictions on how to do this handbook? I mean, can I do it how I think the handbook that, like I would like a handbook to be, or or do I have to follow like the traditional canon? And in my mind, I think I was already um, revisiting this uh, the the uh, decolonization strategy, 
and I'm here I'm taking decolonization in a in a wide uh, way of understanding it in terms of not only in relation to to uh, uh, European imperialism and colonization, but also decolonization in terms of maybe um, uh, decolonization of uh, a field of thought from um, the cer certain um, schools or even uh, genders <laughs> of uh, that have uh, been uh, most important uh, in in writing and teaching of international law um, in the Americas. Also, the issue of language. Um, I mean, there are many there are many ways that we could understand decolonization of of thought um, and of of teaching um, in international law, and specifically in this field of um, Latin America. So I was asked originally to 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 um, focus the handbook on Latin America, but from that initial approach, I immediately um, started to think like Latin America again is is um, if if we focus on Latin America without thinking the role of empire or, or the role of Europe right in the colonization uh, period, as well as the the Uni United States in the informal colonization uh, period of, of the 19th century um, and, and the role and, and the current role still of the United States in relation to, to, to Latin America, then I think the um, handbook would already be deficient if we had that single foes, that narrative of, of a, like some type of a homogeneous idea of Latin America and excluding the United States as if it did not have a relation or, uh, or um, um, the European colonization period as well. So that was one of the first, um, you know, um, thinking about how, how to focus on um, uh, this, uh, you know, uh, unavoidable issue of um, the origins of international on the Americans. And if we would take the traditional canon, uh, like the old fashioned, um, uh, first half of the 20th century canon, um, one of the Latin American international lawyers um, focus was to give it a Spanish origin, right? Like um, you know, focus the roots on the Spain, on Spain um, and that way we would have a civilized origin to international on the region. Um, and even the, even the concept of Latin America comes from the eight, an 1850s reaction to um, the United States appropriating the whole name of the continent, America, um, as the state, and then, um, but also intervening in the region. And, and so um, uh, Carlos Calvo and other um, uh, diplomats that were in Paris at that time started using the term Latin America in relation to, to the region and also even in international law. And Carlos Calvo was the first to use Latin America as a anti, anti imperialist way of defining the region, right? So, so there we have a first issue of how in this handbook, how to um, uh, tell this original historical part and how long the history part should be um, and what the focus should be um, and, and how to retell maybe this story about the connection with the United States and uh, Spain in this original um, story of narrative. And then the other, the next um, moment was how to tell the, in the handbook, um, what uh, section or how long should the section be and also how, what type of focus we should have in terms of the independence moment, right? From um, the, 18, the early 1800s um, all the way to the end of the century, really it's the entire 19th century, mostly in the first half, but um, there are issues you know, with Cuba and Puerto Rico all the way towards the end of the century. And if we include Brazil, another issue, should we include Brazil in, 
in this narrative. And of course, we think we should. Um, and of course, Haiti, right? Because if we had this very narrow idea um, of Latin America in the old fashioned uh, 20th century um, perspective, we would exclude Haiti and possibly Brazil from, from that because of um, and the way they were colonized because of the language, you know, um, issues because um, of their relation to uh, not to Spain, um, but, but to Portugal and France. So um, with my co-editors, which I forgot to mention, uh, Laura Betancourt and, and Juan Amaya Castro, and um, our junior uh, co-editor, Daniel Quiroga, we, we discussed this um, on how to include, and we decided that we should have a, a why, which is another way of decolonizing the, the making of the handbook um, is to have a broader view of uh, the role of the European states in the Americas and also to include other states that might normally not be included if we were to narrowly um, view the focus on, on, um, on a, utopian Latin America, right? So, um, and Haiti, I think it's also central and um, not only because it was the second independent nation um, of the Americas, but also in the relation to its independence debt and the, the initiating um, and a recolonization of Haiti through debt with the payment that it had to make to France for its independence debt. So, so that's another type of colonization that we tend to forget about, which is the, uh, the, the neo-imperial uh, colonization of um, uh, through other means, right? Uh, economic means in this case, or even cultural ones, if we also think of the Cold War era, which is um, another moment that is often forgotten in these historical narratives. So um, this is another moment that we included. And then um, the, the writing of um, the law of nations and then later international law and this period of um, and the independence where even though it's an, an elite group of, of um, diplomats and um, you know, Creole uh, tending toward uh, forgetting the, the miscegenation of the continent and the other population, they did have um, a more, how would I say, um, a more dignified position in terms of representing their states and trying to not allow further colonization um, through the use of diplomatic tools and in, 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 in a very early version of international law. Um, and so I think this, this is another peer that we want to cover in the handbook that we think is very important um, with, you know, with taking into account some of the critical aspects that maybe the, um, the 20th century uh, Latin American scholars might have left out, right? So um, this, this period we include as well. And then the entrance of the United States um, to, to uh, as, as the new hegemon, you know, after Spain leaves, Gradually, the United States, with um, taking over most of the territory of Mexico, right, the, um, the Treaty of Guadalupe and the enlargement of half, half of the United States um, is in, in debt to, to Mexico because of the territory that is taking over. And of course, um, you know, Louisiana and, and uh, well, we have a, a whole narrative here of how um, the expansion of the United States is connected to um, the, the, all of the region, all of the Americas um, in relation to international law and um, the, the way that the, the narrative, even from the United States is, is told in a different perspective. Um, if, you, if you look at, um, international law alone. It seems like the United States is more connected to Europe in, in, in the way that sometimes it is told um, or the rest of the world rather than this, this part of the expansion of, of uh, the United States territory and its interventions in the region, right? And of course, the famous Monroe Doctrine 
which was appropriated by the Latin Americans in a reaction to, to the United States, but um, um, in a way that, that uh, the United States did not like um, the use of the, the count, counter narrative to the Monroe Doctrine is yes, let's um, defend our territories together, right? From European intervention. Okay, so, so that would be another issue that we, we found very important to include in, in the handbook. And um, I, then when we arrive to the 20th century, we begin to look at the, the narratives of the Latin American international law um, um, leaders of this movement and of these um, very important texts, as well as the conferences in the region but also how they dealt with um, um, the, the, the interventions of the United States and reacted to them. Um, and, and, and also um, the, the counterpoint, I think, is to look at uh, in the 19th century was like, um, or the early 19th century was the relation to Haiti, but in the late 19th century, we could say that the relation was to the colonization of Africa. So how, how could a Latin American internationalist like Carlos Calvo participate in the um, colonization of Africa with the Berlin Conference in the 1880s? So it's a very big contradiction, like, okay, please do not intervene in, in our territory, please, you know, please do not recolonize us, but um, we'll help you um, uh, me, uh, with this uh, partition of Africa and Carlos Calvo became famous because of how he helped Portugal get um, its peace out of Africa. So there we have another one of these uh, interesting contradictions, which is not told in a classic, you know, um, narrative of, of uh, the, the golden age of Latin American international law. Um, and also the promotion of, of this period of Latin American international law, how the, um, how the essentialism or the identity of a Latin America as a region um, by these um, very educated, very sophisticated, um, um, almost sometimes even more Europeanized <laughs> than the, you know, they probably spoke like Alejandro Alvarez spoke better and wrote better French than he did Spanish. And, and lived most of his life in Geneva, uh, as well as Carlos Calvo. Um, but how, how they, um, uh, by identifying or by in, um, essentializing the region, um, they exclude um, most of the, the population um, in the region. So like Alejandro Al Alvarez would say that diversity is dangerous, right? Like the the um, see and and would identify Latin America as a Catholic, um, um, very educated European, you know, descendants of European, um, and uh, very sophisticated. But he was talking about more about his own relation to um, uh, his own identity, we could say. Um, but in any case, it is it, you could also see it as a very important golden period of Latin American international law in which that developed uh, doctrines of non-intervention, of you know, sovereignty, of um, um, the identity of the state with the Montevideo Convention, like with uh, the characters, and which um, ironically, the, the, um, in the decolonization period of uh, Asia and Africa, um, they took over many of these um, principles and ideas coming from the Latin American international law, because they saw it as a as a, as a tool for decolonization. So, like the the principle or the the doctrine of uti possidetis was used by by the African um, uh, independence uh, or decolonization movement in the uh, second half of the twentieth century. So. There, there is another issue there that we could connect to this idea of decolonization and, and how to retell the story of this moment. Then um, later we will come into the second half of the 20th century and our 
our um, point was how, how to include this uh, second half of the 20th century and in the context of the Cold War, right? And here again, we have tension between there is not a homogeneous position of the Latin American states in relation to the United States and the Soviet Union in the context of the Cold War. So there are some states that some parts of the period, uh, Mexico, Argentina, of course, later Cuba with, with the revolution, um, will tend to more of a, of a socialist leaning, you know, type of, of vision of uh, um, the, their economy and, and their society. And some, you know, we, we have Guatemala at one point, we have several like, um, moments in where, where it's a more left-leaning, um, Soviet-oriented, perhaps, um, uh, states. And then we have the other, the contrast with other more conservative positions and more U.S.-leaning, uh, like especially Colombia, I would, I would say, um, Colombia with uh, the, the relation to um, the um, uh, taking out Cuba from the Organization of American States and um, always trying to be in, in good graces with the United States. So there are some, some, some states in the region that will tend more to one side or the other. So um, that, that is another issue that we thought would be very important to include in retelling or decolonizing the way the narrative of how Latin America is in this moment of the Cold War and the issues that come up. Um, of course, um, another way of understanding decolonization uh, in, the, in our approach to the, to the handbook is to include um, the gender, um, like the, the, the rights to vote and the, the feminist movement, and then um, the whole process of, of gender, um, that is also trying to have an identity in the region that is not always in correlation to um, the United, United States feminist or European feminist. So here we have a very interesting moment of, of how to um, not only include uh, feminism or in, in international law and, um, and rights and uh, to sexual autonomy and et cetera, but how to also, how was it a reaction to um, uh, feminist uh, theories and leadership coming from Europe and the United States? So there were some many collaborations, but there were also tensions um, in that moment. And then of course, human rights, and um, and racial, you know, um, race or the criti critique of racism and the racial history um, or racist history of the Americas was also um, an issue that we thought was very important to include in this period. That is also not generally accept uh, integrated into a narrative of international law. Um, so here's well, here's all of the. Um, different alliances of women in the Americas that we think is important to look at. And finally, one of the um, other aspects of how to look at um, this handbook from a decolonizing perspective or how to approach it was, is the issue of the economic um, and, and neo-colonization of um, the economy in the region in the second half of the 20th century, and of course in the in this 21st century, um, and 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 this is perhaps the most contemporary um, critiques that are um, uh, coming out in uh, by by many scholars is is to not leave out the economic angle. So and to uh, to combine how how can you look at um, the imbalances of um, the economy, um, poverty. Etc. In relation to the other um, um, gender, race, <laughs> and imperialist ideas that that we want to look at, so it's it's very complex 
to uh, have all of this in a handbook, but um, we think we're, we're, we're looking at it and maybe I can share um, the actual table of contents to give you an idea. So if I can find it, it's hard to find the exact, uh oh, now I lost it, sorry. Um, okay, I think I have it in a PDF. Sorry, where is it when you need it? <laughs> I had it ready. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, well, I, I don't know why I'm not finding it. Let me see if I can do a quick search. Um, so so um, after, you know, all of these discussions of four, like of the, the substantive contents of the handbook, um, we also thought that um, it was very important to think about who is writing these articles, right? Because um, that is another that we tend to forget that um, the, the colonization of knowledge is also like who, who writes, who makes the history, who writes the theory, um, where it's coming from, what perspectives that person has, um, how representative are they of, of um, the, the, the approach that you want to take so that was another very important um, moment that we had in terms of deciding who would write. And so fortunately, and I finally found the text, but now I can't find where to share. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. Okay, so um, here we have the, the, the latest version of the authors and, and the table of contents. And um, we, we started to identify like which, which authors and we have, we have um, I think a very balanced approach in terms of gender representation, in terms of regional representation, um, in terms of more traditional perspectives and more um, uh, nuanced critical perspectives. Um, and, and we came up with uh, these chapters, which we think, you know, has to have a foreword by someone who has, Eduardo Alencia Espina, who has been um, a member of the international, we would call him more of the, the traditional perspective, but he has been a registrar at the International Court of Justice and has been in all of the um, important uh, uh, organs of the United Nations um, and now is an international law commission. Um, so we thought he would be a representative of a, a general overview um, and a theoretical introduction, which is for his which would represent like the also the Latino uh, in the United States, a Cuban uh, immigrant um, who, who teaches international law in the United States um, would be another very important perspective in that sense. Um, so we that's why we have him. Um, and then, um, then some of the issues that we were discussing or that I presented before on how much, what part of the handbook to give to this uh, historical era. And we decided to divide it like um, in the colonial era, we have, you know, the issue of conquest, borders and slavery that we, we think is very important. Um, with a European, North American and Latin American representatives there. And then we have the 19th century with the revolutions, independence and how the law of nation begins to uh, be um, presented in, in the light and used in the 19th century. And maybe you have recognized some of these authors um, uh, that, that are well known like David Armitage, Ar Ar Arno Becker Lorca, Fabia is also, I think, in your series on, on uh, the, the series, the UCL series. Um, and, and maybe some that are less known because they might be more historians than 
um, than uh, international lawyers. Uh, so that that is also a balance that we thought. And this period, like this this section, nationalism, to take into account race, gender, and nationhood, we thought it was really important approach in in viewing this period um, in, and seeing it more nuanced. And also again, the issue of race and citizenship, which would you would normally not think of in a in a handbook. Um, and then we enter, and I think the this division of the centuries it works really well in, in terms of the chronology, but in actual fact. So the first half of this, the 20th century, we see the, the issue of regionalism, right? The, the, the Latin American international law. And there you have, you know, like someone like Juan Pablo Scarfi, who has um, uh, become a very important name in, in um, Latin American international law and his books that, that he's a, uh, he produces at the at the speed of light. He produces uh, um, uh, text and books, um, and so a very important view of his um, or somebody like Matthew Miro, who has been working on this, these issues for for many more years. Um, political asylum, multinational corporations, um, which in, here we start entering. The, the issue of like a neo-colonialism and how um, multinational corporations enter uh, into the region. And then of course, international organizations and courts, um, immigration, US imperialism and gender. So we have like one whole chapter from um, Catherine Marino who, who just um, put out a book on, on Pan-American feminist movements. So we'll have that in the in the early 20th century, um, but in the second half of the 20th century, um, we have you know um, very traditional chapters, or they look traditional, right? International organizations, but they are have this uh, critical perspective. But a chapter that would probably never be included in a handbook such as this is one on revolutions, right? Because revolutions inherently go against the state and you know and the state is is the the essence of international law the focus on the state but we think the way that the haitian mexican and cuban revolutions um, uh, affected the understanding of international and the law in the region is essential to the handbook and so we have Vidya kumar who has been working on uh, revolutions for a while now and, and would be the perfect scholar. Unfortunately, she, she accepted. Um, and uh, then, then uh, well, we all know, probably know Samuel Moyne, but his perspective is also very important um, with his connection to his, uh, the, the, the history of human rights, but also the United States and, and um, the place and the work with Latin America. Um, so and and human rights, we we have several perspectives, like um, from a historical one, but also from we we would think a more traditional uh, contemporary view of inter inter American system of human rights. However, Viviana Kristishevich, who's writing this article, will will do it more from the NGO um, perspective, like how uh, non governmental organizations have moved the inter American system. To the place, so it's not a state-focused view, or or uh, or just a um, like violations-focused view of the inter-record system, but more of how in, um, in, in non-governmental organizations have pushed um, the um, the practice and and the scholarship on on human rights in the inter-American system. Um, so, and we have of course a chapter on indigenous peoples. And I think the, the ones that were most difficult in terms of identifying people, like we wanted someone who was not, you know, who had a, uh, who hopefully was indigenous or, or had been working with indigenous and was not from the United States or Europe. And, and it's really interesting to think, to, to think about this production of knowledge um, in terms of indigenous people and race, right? Like if, if we look at Afro-Latin America, most of the scholarship is also done 
uh, from in the United States or from the United States. And that's one of the one of the difficulties that we had also of people who could write, um, not that they're not enough, but that could write in English, in a, a scholar, scholarly English, or write in Spanish that we could later translate. Um, so we, we had that issue as well. Um, so let me jump over here to some of the more contemporary um, articles of the 21st century, the law and development, um, like an, a section on sex. <laughs> That's also a way of decolonizing the, the, the way that we would think about international law. Um, and uh, well, more, more traditional uh, that you would think would be more traditional chapters like international criminal law, international environmental law, but always from a, a, a perspective from uh, the Americas, right? And, and, the, and the writers that we could get from the region. So some of these writers, as you can see, some of the names you may not recognize because they're either younger or they write mainly in Spanish or Portuguese, um, or they are not situated in the, the locations of traditional production of knowledge, but they are excellent scholars um, um, and, and we, we wanted to include them. So that is another way that we thought of how to do this in terms of international. I think my time is running up or has it run up? Almost run out, okay. So I'll just conclude with the last section which was like which states to include like should we just do representative states of like um, who have had a main role in it like um, the United States, Argentina, Mexico, uh, maybe Colombia, Brazil, or should we include states that would normally would not be included or should we just include them all and in the end we were fortunate to have enough space to include them all um, and the idea of each of the chapter sections is how international law in their state um, became like how it was perceived or presented from their state, um, not just from the traditional like contribution argument like uh, Bolivia contributed to international law and this and this, but but also how it affected or impacted um, international law in the state um, in 6000 words right like almost, that's the other pro problem, right? The limitation of the word count. But um, we were very happy to, to include all these states. And some of the states were more difficult than others, um, and perhaps because the scholarship in those states um, has, has not, you know, um, has, has been very uh, traditional in terms of, you know, ha handbook, um, textbooks that uh, discuss, but maybe not academic critical articles on, on their state in relation to um, international law. So it was a little bit difficult, some countries more than others, but we managed to get a fabulous group of, of scholars um, and, and lawyers and historians to write these articles. So we're very happy with the final result. And um, I don't know if this was <laughs> a way of, of uh, connecting to, to the topic that, that you have um, given us for the series, but I just wanted to, to present my own experience with my, my uh, three colleagues uh, of the handbook and how we approached um, uh, a way of decoloniz decolonizing the construction of knowledge in, in, um, in this specific handbook. So I think I can stop there and then open up to questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Obregón. Uh, it was a, a delight to, to listen to your presentation. Um, I have a ton of questions, <laughs> but- um, I can I'm... tell in your, fa in your reactions, <laughs> <laughs> you're like, yes, no, yes. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm also, I want to remind our, our listeners and viewers that uh, in, for the next 10 minutes, you can send any questions that you would like uh, to Professor Obregón. Um, uh, and as, uh, as a reminder, I will not read your names because we would need to you know, get some consent forms and we don't have those uh, over Zoom. Uh, so, um, but I, I, will, I will start then. 
um, with a few questions. And I guess the, the main one that comes to mind uh, revolves around this, this, this contradiction that you mentioned between um, how Calvo and, and Bayo and all of these uh, criollos, uh, um, Latin Americans of European descent, um, uh, were the ones who were doing all the speaking, all the talking in, in terms of international law in the um, in the Americas, at least in Latin America. And um, uh, you've mentioned in your scholarship before that uh, to do a handbook, it is important to um, use the stories that come from the periphery and the semi-periphery. Uh, and uh, sometimes even like, for example, with a handbook for the history of international law, you're, one is not able to escape the, the Eurocentrism of international law because it is so embedded. And so we need to make an effort to include these stories from other parts of the world. And I'm thinking uh, if it is not something similar when, when we um, focus our attention on Latin America, and we, for example, from a historical perspective, there are several efforts to telling the history of the independence movements in South America, not from the perspective of, of the, the Criollo revolutions, but say from the perspective of those failed revolutions, the Tupac Amaro revolution, the Pumacawa revolution, uh, that were not accepted by the Criollos because they were led by indigenous people or, or mestizo people. Um, do we not risk uh, by not by, by doing by focusing on these criollo authors? Do we not risk ending up with a um, metropolitan history of the periphery? And and how can we deal with the lack of sources and lack of materials uh, regarding to international law um, to to refocus and have a peripheral history of the peripheral history? Um, no, well, precisely, precisely, the handbook thought exactly of that question, and we are not, we are not retelling that history in the same way. Um, you know, I, unfortunately, I went through the table of contents too quickly, but um, the people that we have chosen um, either are are have, are already retelling the history of the region, like you know, somebody like Arnulf Becker Lorca or uh, Juan Pablo Scarfi, like they would never just retell that in, in, in the, the traditional way that it was uh, um, presented in the 20th century. So, so we, we thought very carefully of um, inviting those people to, for those chapters, um, because we didn't want exactly what you're saying to happen. So. Um, fortunately, we're, we think that those people, and we were also going to have a few meetings to to discuss these chapters, um, because we think that that that's very important in terms of um, making sure that uh, we're all on the same page. I'm sure that the chapters will not be uh, homogeneous in their approaches, right? Like, and, and maybe they will disagree on on many issues, but the type of authors and the type of of um, a chapter focus, the titles of the chapter even, would, would never uh, fit into that traditional perspective, right? Without, rec without leaving them, I mean, we do have to recognize that this period of uh, Latin American international law as, as from these Creole elites uh, happened, right? And, and, and we can be critical about it, but also, um, also point out that maybe some of the contributions that are still important there. However, we, that we're trying to um, distance ourselves from retelling that story again, because then what's, what's the point, right? Like what's the point of, of doing this handbook if we're just going to repeat that, story, that narrative, right? Um, so yeah, so I, I think I'll, I'll send you the, <laughs> the table of contents and I think you'll, you'll understand that we've, we've thought about that very carefully. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, I could see the 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 effort in the selection of authors and in the topics. It's just this: uh, how does one critique uh, the canon without mentioning the canon? Is in itself a a, a complicated question. Oh no, um, no, no, the canon will be mentioned, but but it will be you know discussed on <laughs> like the the pros and the cons, right? Because it's not it's not yeah. necessarily all bad, right? It's like it's it it there was 
there were very important contributions and anti anti imperialist contributions right the, you know just just the principle of non intervention is very uh, is innate to the to the way that latin american international law developed right and 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 it comes from and it comes from carlos calvo and it comes from all of these despite whatever Calvo did with, with uh, Africa or his immigration policies, you know, for, for white immigration for Argentina. I mean, you, you can look at um, it, it in, in a more nuanced way because these individuals as we, as we all are, are more complex than, you know, a single uh, focus idea of, of them. Um, so yeah, so, we, so they will be there but we will just look at them in a more in, in a more nuanced way. Right. Yes. Um, and and one more question as well. Uh, I don't think we have anyone from the audience just yet, so uh, I'm going to take advantage. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, are the um, recently there's been so many discussions between uh, methodology between lawyers and and historians and how they approach uh, the history of international law and I was wondering if those debates uh, for yeah. example with uh, Professor Koskaniemi and and uh, and uh, Professor Orford with the uh, contextualist uh, is that going to be addressed in any way or if that's if, if that's beyond the scope of the of the handbook well we do have an introductory theoretical chapter so that that Jorge Esquirol is doing um, maybe I should share again the table of contents because we do have this theoretical because uh, chapter where where he will do traditional and critical approaches, right? And he will he will look at you know, not only from the international law perspective, but how, how the history has been presented. Um, in, 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 but but I don't think we'll go into the debate of historians versus lawyers, because we actually do have several histori historians like Tamara Herzog is a very important historian from, uh, um, uh, I think originally Portugal and, and, and Spain, but she's at Harvard and she, and she um, has been studying um, in, in like the legal history um, and better than all of us together, right? Like, so she's a very sophisticated scholar in, in legal history, but she's not, she's not a lawyer, an international lawyer. Um, however, there are, we couldn't find international legal scholars that did as good work in this, in this very early period. Like this is the most difficult, was one of the most difficult historical periods huh. to look at from a legal perspective, because there are many from other types of perspective, like in, in colonial history, but but uh, historians who do legal history of that early period in the way that we thought would connect to the law of nations and sovereign and issues of sovereignty of that early period, it's like um, on one hand, right? It's very few. Um, like we we would have used also Lauren Benton, who's also a very important historian. In, in that era and that and that field, but she she wasn't available. Unfortunately, she couldn't. Um, um, so so those type of historians, I think, are really necessary because they do the archival work that that some of the legal uh, or the or the lawyers who do history uh, don't do or is not as or don't do as well or do not have the training to do as well as the historians. So. So we don't have a problem with with the historians that do legal history, but um, but uh, that debate might show up in the theoretical introduction. So. Well, uh, unfortunately, we have uh, run out of time. I would continue asking questions until eternity, um, <laughs> but. Um, Thank you so much for this very enlightening presentation. And uh, I look uh, forward to the handbook with great interest. Um, and I wanted to thank uh, everyone for participating in this session and just remind you that our next meeting uh, will be on November 15th um, to discuss Race Me Too with Dean Mindy Chen Wishart uh, from Oxford. And once again, thanking Professor Linnea Obregón for her time uh, uh, in this presentation. Um, I, I, I leave you uh, and thank you very much for your time and patience and, and attention. Thank you, Alonso, and, and thank you, Lisa. For, for the organization.
and my best to Ralph. Thank you very much.